today for um, today's Architecture Alumni Talk Series. Um, my name is Professor Cameron Brune. I'm the Dean and Head of School here in the University of Queensland School of Architecture. Before we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and pay our respects and acknowledge their custodianship of the lands on which many of us are meeting today. I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And collectively, we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Jasmine is a founding partner of Mass Design, an architecture office in Shanghai, China. Mass works across the disciplines of architecture, interior, landscape, product and brand design on projects ranging in scale from furniture pieces to 30,000 square metre mixed use regeneration developments. With an emphasis on materiality and functionality at the core of design, the practice seeks a symbiosis of old and new, creating modern functions in original spaces that are imbued with the meaning they derive from their contexts. Jasmine has a wide range of experience in office, residential, restaurant and hospitality design in cities across China, taking these projects from concept through to execution. Jasmine is, of course, alum of the University of Queensland, um, having graduated with studies in business, arts and architecture. She earned her Bachelor of Design Studies in 2009 and went on to complete a Master's of Architecture at Tsinghua University in Beijing, completing that in 2013. Her master's thesis was published in Masterclass, which is a frame publication and ignited a passion for heritage, vernacular, reuse, and the beauty of ordinary architecture. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jasmine to address us this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Cameron. Thank you very much. And good morning from a very early Shanghai. Let me just bring up my screen. I am very honored to uh, be presenting in this series. I think it's such a valuable series for professionals to see where architecture has taken people after UQ and also very invaluable for those of you that are still in architecture school because I think something about architecture and it being such a critical and analytical um, education allows us to actually apply it to so many other fields if you find that architecture is not for you. For example, I have friends that are master bakers or design strategists that go into politics. So I think it's a really fun series. And what I've enjoyed the most about this series is listening to people's stories, not just about the destination, but how they've made decisions and the journey that they've taken after completing their bachelor or master's. Um, so like Cameron said, I did a series of um, uh, degrees at UQ and I did my bachelor of design and then I have been based in China for 13 years now. And uh, like he said, heading up a co-founder of a mass design. Um, in terms of getting to architecture, it was a little bit uh, complicated. I was always interested and semi-talented in art, but it wasn't really something that was on my radar or perhaps my parents' radar about something that could be steered towards architecture, probably also because my dad was a civil engineering dropout. I actually st started an arts degree and it, was just to test and find a few different things that maybe I could follow. And I ended up doing a marketing subject. And in this marketing subject, we had to make and create strategy for a product. And in hindsight, I realized that it was this making aspect of, the, of that, that course that really resonated with me. Fast forward a few years later, I started to question if you know business was for me and maybe there was something a little bit more creative that I could do and at that time graphic design was basically the hottest thing that you could do uh, in Australia it needed an OP1 and this sort of started my research into what um, creative courses there could be so I went through basically every course in Queensland it didn't really occur to me to leave where I had, you know, Brisbane, I was born and raised. 
And I went from graphic design to interior design, interior architecture, and finally um, decided on architecture at UQ. Um, at the time, I had friends who were in their later years in the architecture degree and also friends doing medicine. And it was a bit of a joke amongst them that uh, it would be faster and easier to do a medicine degree. I don't fully agree, but I have never done a medicine degree. But suffice it to say, I don't think I was prepared for what architecture had to, what was coming. But uh, I think it was a very exciting and interesting uh, decision to make for me. Um, so this is something that I think is a view that everybody is familiar with, perhaps if you're tuning in today and these lush subtropical views of Queensland are very nice to see from this uh, very urban environment that I'm in. Uh, I also have very lovely memories of climbing out of those windows at 3 a.m. in the morning and sitting on the ledges with people after working long hours in the Mac Lab. But I think something about my time at UQ that I didn't realize at the time was sort of the overarching paradigm of one, of course, touching the earth lightly, but perhaps like some of the other speakers before have said, the book, The Poetics of Space was very much part of the curriculum and the thought process of the, the sort of approach to architecture at UQ. And I think at the time I didn't realize that that was sort of planting a seed in me for how I would want to practice architecture later. Um, I think it was this, you know, we, we design for the climate, the site, the sense of place, and it's this attention to, you know, these details of the human condition, the joys of moments, how place has sort of evolved and how our connection to different types of space that was there, but I didn't perhaps explore so much and wouldn't realize until later. Um, towards the end of third year, I started thinking about actually going overseas for the internship. I, the fourth year working out internship, and I was always, I always knew that I wanted to live in China. So to give a little bit of a backstory, you can tell from my name, I am half Chinese, but my dad is my dad is the Chinese one, doesn't speak a word of Mandarin, and my blonde haired, blue eyed mother is fluent, was my first Mandarin teacher, and the person that reconnected uh, us to China after four generations having left. So it was always in my mind that I wanted to live there, and this was the perfect opportunity to live in another country and experience something new. And luckily at the time there was another student two years ahead who had actually done an internship in Shanghai with a Chinese Australian firm. So she put me in touch. And actually in the end, I sort of, I packed up and I didn't actually apply until I had arrived in Shanghai. So this is probably a, a view that you're very uh, used to seeing in, uh, of Shanghai. This is actually looking to the east and around 30 years ago, this, this didn't exist. It was farmland and small villages. And over the last 30 years, it's come up. Shanghai is, it's always been a melting pot. It's a port city. She's sparkly and human scale because of the influence of um, the concessions and the old city. She's very dense. And there are so many layers of time that you can read in the urban fabric, which is just uh, endless inspiration. And especially for someone like me, who is very interested in heritage and, and vernacular architecture, it sort of ignited sort of this interest and desire to push these interests further. So just to give you an example, you know, there it is this, the urban fabric is this amazing juxtaposition of high rises, but also these traditional Lelong neighborhoods that you can see on the top left of the screen that actually started as property speculation. And the typical housing in Shanghai, this sort of 
the vernacular housing is a lilong, which is based on this hybrid between a courtyard house and a British terrace, terrace house. So these sort of popped up around 100 years ago, but then you also have a lot of art deco in, this, in the old city, which is about to pretty much be demolished now. You have a lot of actually wooden houses still existing. So it is a city which is very accessible to disappear down lanes and to find the stories and the narratives that exist in the city. Uh, for example, you know, there is a 16th century mansion, it happens to be one of my favorite buildings that is still standing today and has gone through so much history that if you don't know where it is, you, you wouldn't expect this in Shanghai. So I did my internship here in Shanghai and I have to admit that it was not a match for probably for both of us. Um, as you can see for the things that I'm talking about and this sort of what I started to push towards, a, a large commercial firm, a, a medium sized commercial firm and their approach just didn't resonate with me. And at this point I was sort of questioning, do I want to continue with architecture? And I actually went back to business and I worked in uh, e-commerce for about a year. But I, um, I don't like to leave things hanging and I like to finish what I started. So around 2008, Qing, uh, some of the universities in China started developing English programs for master's courses in business and architecture. So Tsinghua in Beijing um, actually had launched one in 2008 and I applied and went to Tsinghua to, I moved to Beijing to do my masters. Uh, so if Shanghai is a sparkly and glittery city, Beijing is an aged, beautiful concrete column that, uh, She's tough, she's gritty, she's northern, and it is a big urban sprawl. Like it's a very large city that you need to think about as five individuals sort of centers in one. But again, like Shanghai, you can find pockets and areas where you have these layers of history. Beijing is the social political capital. And you can really read this in the urban fabric because you have these wide boulevards that, of course, are reminiscent and inspired by, you know, uh, Soviet architecture for this power that should be shown. But you also have this incredibly historical city center where you have the hutongs and perhaps you're, you're aware of the, the courtyard houses, the Sihuyuan, which is the four-sided courtyard. So I, uh, in this city, I also uh, uh, fell in love with walking down lanes and it was actually a very amazing experience because I had been visiting China since I was seven years old. And it was a really great way to uh, actually learn about a city that I really knew that I had a lot of nostalgia for, that I had a lot of connection to, but to do my architecture degree there and to really uncover the layers that you could be living there for 20 years and still be learning about this city was incredible. Something that I've always chosen to do living in both Shanghai, much to the disbelief of some of my family members, um, is to pick housing typologies that I have, that are so removed from what I grew up in with in order to, and to live in these, in these typologies. So, you know, Australia is very wealthy. We have an abundance of land and we have very much sort of a Western or Anglo-Saxon way of arranging space, um, you know, one child, one bedroom, but, you know, here, especially, it's a, it's a great way to test and to understand different living um, typologies. So in Beijing, you can see in the top left-hand corner, this is the bell tower. So when I moved to Beijing for university, I chose to live off campus and live in the heart of Beijing. So Beijing is arranged by a very strong axis and concentric circles that move out. So I lived 
in the center. I could see the drum and bell tower from my courtyard window. And I lived in a, a, force, a courtyard house which had been divided um, lengthways back from the street. And what has happened over the last 50 years with the change, uh, the political changes, is that a lot of these large houses or villas in Shanghai or courtyard houses, which were for nobility before, were divided into smaller sort of apartments. And this is actually, it not only makes you live in a certain way that you, I've never done before, but you understand the, the social and political uh, narratives that have existed to do with these typologies. In Shanghai, um, I actually live now in a, what was the front yard of a large uh, tobacco tycoon estate, and he built um, six different villas, which were then divided up. The person who owned the villa got to pick the nicest apartment, but you can imagine the challenge that this would be if uh, that was your family home. And then you have common spaces. So again, this typology of co-living, which you know is super popular the last few years, especially in China, and a lot of the large funds are pouring a lot of money into co-living, has existed in many different forms, I'm sure all over the world, but especially in, in, in the places that I've lived. So by living in these, these uh, houses, I really have been able to learn so much about how um, the history and the social makeup and the way people use space is different. So this is Tsinghua University. It is the, it's a little bit of the I, one of the Ivy Leagues in Asia. It's the uh, number one university in China and Asia. And I think in one of the rankings, it's 16th. And the architecture school in the world, sorry, the architecture school was started in 1946. So it has, uh, and it's quite has strong history. And when I was doing, uh, when I started this program, it was, uh, just a couple of years started. So I think it was still trying to find its feet. Now it's concentrating a lot on uh, the rapid urbanization um, in China, because China is going through the largest urbanization in the history of mankind from country to city. And, but when I was there, the overarching uh, paradigm was what is a modern Chinese architecture? And if you think about it, Chinese architecture, there was sort of like this stop. There is such a wealth of artistry and craft and history to do with building and different types of vernacular architecture all over the country. But, you know, due to the Cultural Revolution, there was this stop and a, a bottleneck of the, the development of the aesthetic. And this um, you know, China didn't go through a lot of the stages that the rest of the world did. So there was this period of pastiche or, you know, like learning or, you know, referencing maybe too strongly architecture from outside. But there are in the last uh, couple, maybe decade or two, some incredible architects. I mean, there are too many to, to, to list who are looking at regionalism, materiality, craft, uh, really sense of place to bring this, you know, in order to answer what is a modern Chinese architecture. And I was really lucky in my time at Tsinghua to be, for these two handsome guys, to be chairing the program that I was in. And also I think one of them is the vice vice dean of the entire architecture school in Tsinghua. So I would really urge you, if you're interested, to have a look at some of their work. I'll show you a few just shortly after. And I think these guys, along with some of the other visiting professors, because we had professors flying in from the States or other parts of the world, as well as uh, local Chinese professors, were really responsible for making me fall in love with architecture again, because I had questioned it a lot. And living in Beijing, doing this program, it was 
really the best choice for me. And I think at the time I had, you know, written to a few people in Australia and asked them what they thought about doing it. And I think this is something that only you can know and really find a program that resonates with uh, what your interests are. I think I, I'm really happy I realized this and I'll show you a few of their, their projects. So this is actually a private home in the south of China, Yunnan borders uh, Laos and, and Thailand. And it was made for a family that has been given this land because of their community work in this area. Actually, there's a vineyard being planted on it right now. This is in Fujian province, so the province opposite Taiwan, where the vernacular architecture is this like rammed earth made out of uh, mud, hay, brown sugar, that they actually need um, like a mason cutter to cut windows. It's so strong. And this was a school made for the children that lived there. And this is a building just outside of Beijing, which is a library. So you can see this for, for Li Xiaodong, to, this attention to, to um, the material and sense of place and, and really the function of, of what the building needs to be. And similarly for, for uh, Zhang Li, uh, it really relates to the sense of place. And this is another one just outside of Beijing. So all of this, like we did many different workshops and courses, as well as, uh, you know, uh, solidifying Chinese language and culture. And this culminated in my thesis, which of course had to be uh, a sort of a heritage in the heritage zone. And I was very lucky and happy that uh, Li Xiaodong selected me to be um, his student for this. So I just show you very quickly because it's very old work, but um, it was a, a market just to the east of the central axis. And what I wanted to explore was um, to, to break apart this, this in-out dichotomy, because as you know, China loves a wall. And even now when, you know, um, old neighborhoods are demolished and new residential high-rise goes up, a lot of the time you, a fence is put around the whole entire block. So what is what happens is you lose this street life, you lose small scale commerce, you lose the walkability. So I wanted to make sure that we still got density and public space and permeability, and also to sort of pull apart, uh, you know, the inside and outside, and to create sort of a striated hierarchy of different spaces that could still satisfy the need for intense private spaces, but also give back to the community. So it was uh, doing this on both the vertical and horizontal plane to create sort of an elevated pathway for residents and then uh, the ground floor for community to come into the space. Uh, just a few, a few views that could then evolve over time as the, the people changed a little bit how they use the space. Um, yeah, so that takes me to the end of my education. I don't, uh, I tell my friends to slap me if I say I would like to do some more because I spent a lot of time uh, doing this. And I then moved back to Shanghai and I took a job with actually a in-house design team that was responsible for um, a hospital like it was a hospitality company with their own uh, design team that had about 20 different um, uh, food and beverage brands across china and this was such an unexpected amazing experience it was not a big name architecture firm um, but I really lucked out in terms of the team, uh, the creative director and the senior architects um, design approach and what they had done before, as well as the company. Because here, because we were in-house, we controlled everything. And I don't think I've had that much control over a project since. 
So we did everything from industrial kitchen design through to the actual concept, uh, DD drawing, uh, design development drawings, and then um, sort of even custom furniture, custom lighting. We were visiting suppliers. It was a Danish Australian company. So as you know, the Danes have such a reverence for design that this was, this permeated everything that we did. So being my first job, like we would go through 20 different samples to get the right wood grain or even more. So from a design perspective and a scale perspective, for me, this was a really great start. And then from the, the project and business side, it was really interesting to be able to see the decisions being made and also to learn all of the project management that had to go into opening a project. And we had, so we would be running the project, doing the design, even negotiating with the builder for final payments with the, the snagging list. So this, this experience was really invaluable to me starting in architecture. I think I didn't expect the amount of time that we would have to uh, spend on the phone or like I say, like uh, we're firefighters, like putting out uh, fires. Um, I don't think they tell you this in architecture school, but uh, it was, yeah, like I said, a, a really great experience. So I was there for around two years and then I started to think about leveling up and working in at a larger scale and also um, w across different typologies because I'd spent nearly two years doing uh, uh, F&B. And I had um, actually the company that I moved to after graduation, I had stalked them online. So I had found the type of architecture that I, I really liked their aesthetic and what they were doing and I had found who they were and actually even visited them upon like when I was applying for my first job. At the time they were looking for a project architect, not actually like a graduate, so it didn't work out. But through the grapevine and other connections and friends, my name popped up when they were looking and I uh, got a job with um, Mass which is a, which at the time was owned by a parent company who was a developer. Um, what also drew me to mass besides like the different scale and the typologies was they were doing a lot of regeneration work. So taking buildings that were 20 to 40 years old, they were not used anymore because perhaps they were not working programmatically or functionally or you know just the style of the building was not working anymore and they were completely redoing the building rather than it being demolished and injecting new life into the building and of course uh, the surrounding surrounding neighborhood we never actually got our hands on uh, real heritage but this uh, this approach and uh, really resonated with me uh, at the same time, I also started doing uh, food tours for a street food tour company here, which combined two really big loves of mine, which is uh, architecture and food. And I think this also give, gave me another layer to understanding the city and the people that uh, we are designing for here, because, you know, by walking through a city, you can understand so much about the history and the stories and the urban fabric and the way people live. And by eating your way through a city, you get another layer, which is the, the social norms, the, the, the narratives, the stories around food and coming together. So these two really basic things of shelter and sustenance, you know, came together. So for the last few years, these are the things that, that I have been doing concurrently. Um, so let me, oh, i sorry, I'm a little bit slow with the slides, so sorry. I'll jump back and have a look at some of the projects that we did with Wagas. So this was a, a Thai restaurant. And really, I was here on site from 
day one with the senior architects, even washing down that wall to the right to show the workers how to do it. So it really was an incredible hands-on experience. And this was a flagship in Beijing for um, one of their brands. Um, also during, um, actually the three things that I've been working on, which is the, the food tours, architecture, and also a commitment I made to myself to do workshops in heritage and conservation uh, at least once a year, which I haven't managed to do all the time, but um, this, uh, this um, country has so much to discover and very close to Shanghai is a city called Suzhou, which has an, a very active government in terms of heritage. So I did a, a course there with uh, the University of Sapienza from Rome. And then also, I think this is going to be quite familiar to some uh, UQ graduate, uh, UQ students, because I think you also did something there recently. But this is actually where my, Georgetown Penang is where my family, my Chinese family moved to. So it's also a, a city that has my heart. And it, as you know, is a UNESCO city. So they run a lot of conservation workshops, especially to do with the preservation of shop houses. And their workshops are both theoretical, but also hands-on in terms of, uh, you know, the, how to tile or doing the, the, the lime wash on the walls. So sorry, back to math. So a lot of people ask, what is, what is it that you like living uh, like in, in China? And I think one of the things is your, your boundaries are constantly pushed and you're constantly stretched about your way of thinking. So for example, the, the team at Mass when I joined, there were six different nationalities. At one stage, there were eight different languages being spoken across the table at once. So you are, you are forced to learn words that cannot be translated or learn a different way of doing something uh, from a cultural perspective or then again uh, from an architectural perspective so i think it's for me has been such an amazing thing because like i mentioned before i didn't even consider leaving brisbane when i was looking to do my architecture degree so i'm very happy that i took the leap to move and to uh, find this path that uh, sort of it set me on so this was actually the building that I stalked originally. Uh, it, uh, this is an aesthetic uh, that I really like, and it's very minimalist, very clear about um, natural light, showing the building structure, and also like giving back to the, 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 the urban fabric. So this is the building that started it, um, and also a lot of common spaces are, are uh, in, in the building. We also at Mass did a lot of feasibility studies. So even before the project was confirmed, we would do studies in terms of what sort of typologies could go in, what programs could be there, square meters, and if the project was viable. You can see on the bottom what it looked like before. And so this project was a mixture of office and atelier and also uh, apartments. This is perhaps one of the signature projects from, from the, the base brand and it was an old kindergarten and it's located in the heart of what is an old workers uh, um, unit uh, community. So you have like uh, you know grandmas and grandpas hanging out and it's very downtown but at the same time you have this incredible density so having a space like this in the downtown that uh, has a pool surrounded by green and it is a um, it was developed with there's a, a five bedroom villa but also it was testing sort of earlier notions of smaller style um, studios but then larger community uh, living spaces and this was attracted a lot of creatives and still does today. Uh, this is a project um, in Pudong which is to the to the right of the river and this was sort of looking for a little bit more of a higher end brand for the 
for the base series. And also for this project, we drew from some of the typologies, um, actually the Shanghai style um, Shukuman house that I, that I described, that terrace house, which inside had, was a duplex or a triplex. So we tried to insert some of this um, references into some of the, the apartments in this, in this uh, high rise. We've also worked on furniture, doing a lot of large scale uh, residential and office projects. We always found, found it challenging to find suitable furniture that was um, economical. So in conjunction with a very talented furniture designer, the team uh, developed a full range that could be put into every single office or uh, apartment that uh, we designed. And this was, the inspiration was the very ordinary and rudimentary but practical furniture that was, we would find on site. So it developed a little bit more to this, but the line was called Basics. So very paired back, simple uh, furniture that uh, suited the, the aesthetic that we did. This was my first uh, big baby. Uh, it was a, the first uh, on the banks of the Huangpu River. And when it started out, it was going to be a residential area, uh, a residential building. Um, I think it was a good lesson also in um, seeing how the client changes their mind and how this changes. So actually, it was designed as studios, one bedroom, and on that top amazing uh, level, there were triplexes which went in. And when the design was all done, the client decided to change their mind and it turned into offices. So that was a shame, but part of the process of learning how everything continues. Um, uh, we also have worked on more F and B projects. You can see there's definitely an architectural sort of element in here, which is playing with the, the name of Stack itself. And I think in China, you, uh, I was going to say that I think also in, in, in many other parts of the world, something that's really important now these days and that comes from the client brief is something that is Instagrammable. Or here in China, it's called Wang Hong, so which means internet celebrity. So you have, the market is so um, saturated, so um, cutthroat that you need design to bring people in. So the whole package together and you'll find many places that are packed uh, with people taking photographs for their mini blog or their uh, key opinion leader on the internet. So this is a very interesting change in the way that uh, briefs are given that has happened over the last few years. And towards like, you know, uh, 2018, um, the parent company merged and the project started getting much bigger. Uh, like Cameron mentioned, one of them is uh, 30,000 square meters. So compared to sort of these small scale neighborhood projects at the beginning, it really was a big change. Uh, for example, this one is a key landmark in a very commercial zone right near the old city. Um, and it had several different um, actually brands going in like co-housing, service departments, retail, office, and the company sort of changed how they were, um, yeah, uh, their approach. And for us, this also was starting to get a little bit challenging. So in 2019, uh, some of the uh, department, we decided to leave and start our own company with the same name, but a different logo. At the same time, uh, actually in the same month, I had my first child. So it was a very big decision and big change at the beginning of 2019. And we continued to work on similar projects. 
Of course, when you are starting out, you take on more smaller projects also. So we did nightclubs, uh, more F&B, as well as continuing to work on these larger residential projects. Um, this is where our office is located. So it's in the former French concession in Sujahwe. And we are down a lane. And like I was describing um, uh, Shanghai before, it gives endless inspiration for materiality, uh, different living typologies, and just this incredible um, accessibility in the, in the urban fabric. And I'll just conclude with, uh, I think we cannot not mention uh, 2020. So at the beginning of 2020, we actually had a, a restructuring of the company and then lots of changes happened. Uh, this is Shanghai completely empty uh, in February of this year. And I think uh, for us, it was maybe a good month where we worked from home. And then because we're a small office, we came back to the office. So it has been interesting uh, and you really need to take each day as it comes. It's been very stressful because we are a small business, but we were lucky to actually get clients during this time. I think there's something about the Shanghai market that is so large that where you know, some people have to close, it gives opportunity for others to come in and open. So we have been working on a few projects that are since March have been designed and constructed, also, also tiling. And then also we have several other ones on the way and under construction now. So that sort of wraps up a very quick introduction to my architecture journey. Um, I will stop to share. Thank you for listening. And please, if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, Jasmine. That was absolutely fantastic. I'll, I'll monitor the questions, but I'll start with some of my own, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's been great um, to connect with you today. And I think um, the, the brief we gave you, uh, you followed to the, to the letter about giving us a sense of both your current practice in architecture, but also your journey as a practitioner and the way in which um, your studies here at UQ have informed your practice over the, over the following years. So it's been, been great to hear about um, those various experiences. Um, I want to start with a, um, a question about heritage because it seems to me you've really um, been at the forefront of new approaches to, or new attitudes around heritage in the built environment in China. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the opportunities and the challenges of that particular type of work within um, Chinese cities. Okay, I think to start, one of the really important things is the way that, say, the Western world views heritage is very different to an Asian uh, view of heritage. So, for example, if you go to the Forbidden City or the Summer Palace in Beijing, you will find it freshly painted and as it would be when it was built centuries ago. And I think this is sometimes a disconnect with how we expect heritage to be because in the Asian perspective, it should be uh, maintained to this point. Um, I really am a baby in terms of uh, heritage. It's just a, a big passion of mine. So I, I cannot really talk with great authority, but there are, I think you maybe you hear about a lot of you know the old city going, but a lot of it is wooden architecture and kind of it's not fit for modern day living anymore. So places that, for example, there are plaques all over my neighborhood where buildings are protected and uh, the local governments want to protect it. And there are a lot of architects that are working towards this. I think it's sometimes difficult that, you know, like in London in the 70s, there was a lot of demolition also. So it, it's very difficult to conserve everything. Um, but a lot of the ones that can be conserved are. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how, what else I could say about. In the area, I mean, you're talking about the 
and particularly in your hospitality work about that, um, the way in which proprietors are increasingly want the Instagrammable, the, um, that edge that will um, allow them to succeed in their, in their hospitality business. Is, is there a heritage edge to that in terms of um, the, you know, the, the uniqueness of a heritage space or a existing building that might become part of a hospitality experience? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm not the 21 year old that is the KOL, but I think there is definitely when you have, when you have uh, the soul uh, of a building there, I think it always adds value and a resonance to people. And I think also in the last 10 years, there is more awareness from the general population about these sorts of things. You know, before it was like, we all need to move to a modern high rise because this is what modern living is. Whereas now you have more Chinese who are picking to live in the houses or the housing typologies that maybe they left 20 years ago uh, and restoring them and having a lot more care and love for them. So I think for hospitality projects, it's really hard to say because it's so fickle, but I do think it helps add to the story or the narrative that maybe the proprietor wants. Not all proprietors want this because actually people come for a coffee and spend two hours there taking photos and you actually need substance to back it up. So the design is one part of it, but uh, you also need to have a good product at the same time. So over, over the last 10 years of practice in China, what, what would you characterize as being the biggest change to the profession? Um, I'd say around... 10 years ago, there started to be more awareness about environment and environmental design. Uh, I think this, and just generally also in terms of all parts of life, you see this is a big change in how people are living. I think Shanghai just also started a no waste, no food waste uh, program. So it is very active in this sort of sense. Um, other changes that have happened? I, one of the changes I think might be interesting is that relationship between local, locally established practices and international practice. How, as, how has that sort of relationship evolved, would you say? I think there are, I mean, from what I see, because we are a very small, small mm. company, so I haven't um, experienced this myself. But I do see, yes, there is a lot of collaboration happening and then often branch offices opening here. So I think there, you know, there have been a lot of Australian firms here for the last 20 years, but you see more and more collaboration between uh, perhaps international firms that are smaller. So I think you know, there, is a, there is a nice sharing of information that is happening both ways, actually, to learn how it have works here and also at the same time to learn from uh, other other countries. Mm. So, I mean, in terms of your community of practice, do you have other? Is there a group of other smaller practices around your neighbourhood? We know in lots of cities, architects tend to be in the architecture offices tend to be in the same sort of neighbourhoods. What's your What's your community of practice look like there in in Shanghai in terms of who you're connecting with? Yeah, in our immediate environment, uh, not so much. I think there's like uh, down the lane, there's some design companies and an art gallery. But I think when you're a small company, we definitely, um, you know, we expand and contract depending on the projects that we are doing. So we're, we're not hiring five more staff if we have a large project. We are hiring freelancers or people we've worked before or doing something collaboratively with a landscape designer you know, I think it's, it's always tough and it always depends on the client's needs and budget. So in China, a lot of the time, the, the timeline is super fast and everything needs to be delivered yesterday. So it, it takes a lot of things to come in to make a project happen. And sometimes these things aren't valued by the client or sometimes they are. So it just really depends on their goal for the well, it's been absolutely fantastic to connect with you this morning, Jasmine. Thank you so much for your presentation. Really great to have an insight um, into your work. 
Um, I'm sure everyone online has also found the session really interesting and inspiring. Um, our next webinar for everyone online will be on Thursday, the 17th of September, and will feature Rachel Barnard. She's the executive, executive director and founder of Young New Yorkers. And you can register for this webinar via the events page on our website. So as many of you will see, we're, we're traveling the world for this alumni series in second semester. We're in Shanghai this morning, um, and in our next um, event, we'll be connecting with New York. Um, in closing, I'd also like to thank our valuable donors to the School of Architecture's Student Culture and Experience Fund. Our champions, uh, Rothy Lohman, and our advocates, Nettleton Tribe, BVN, and Populous. And their, their contribution to this fund is really helping us um, advance the culture here in the school. So, Jasmine, thank you again for your presentation, um, for your generosity and your insights. Um, it's been fantastic to um, connect with you. And uh, we look forward to a continuing dialogue over the coming years. Um, and for, for those of you online, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a great day, um, wherever you might be in the world. Thank you. Thanks, Jasmine. Bye. Bye-bye.